I want to frame this keynote around the question, what advice would I give a person who is an emerging leader about including women in leadership? And the lovely thing about giving advice is that you can pontificate as much as you, you like because you're just dispensing it, you're not actually receiving it. Or, or, or maybe I will frame it as things to keep in mind if we are to achieve the goal of including women in leadership. A year ago, I attended a, an event in which Hillary Clinton spoke, and I was struck by this line from her speech. Equality of women is the great unfinished work of the 21st century. And I was struck by it because it seemed a really optimistic statement because it assumed that the work will be finished. And I'm not sure that it will be in this century, but we can make progress and we have made progress. And I think that including women in positions of leadership, real leadership, and when I say that it's because often companies will say we have women in real leadership, but, but really the women are not in the positions of real power. I think including women in leadership is essential to this question of equality. And the case for including women is not that women are better than men or that women will necessarily make better leaders. It is simply that women are human and make up half the world's population. So we know that changing laws and policies and, and having what is often called best practices are all important for creating change. But I have always believed that culture should be given primacy not because it is more important than economics or law or politics, but because it is the most complex, the most layered, and the most difficult to change. I think cultural change happens with storytelling and with human creativity. I am, of course, biased because I'm a writer, and literature is the love of my life. But I know from my life as a reader, not just a writer, that stories can profoundly change the way we look at the world. I have also always believed that we can create a world that is much better than we have, more equal, more just. And it may be naive, but I think perhaps we should embrace a considered naivete from time to time. And so the first thing I think an emerging leader should keep in mind on the subject of including women is embrace a considered naivete from time to time. I have had the good fortune of traveling quite a bit and meeting women in different parts of the world, and I have become convinced that there is a universal female experience. The universal experience that I speak about is more emotional than not. For example, the women I meet in different parts of the world are all familiar with the idea of shrinking themselves to accommodate male egos. They're familiar with putting their dreams aside, suspending their aspirations. They're familiar with being the ones who are expected to compromise in heterosexual relationships. They're familiar with their bodies being seen not as belonging to them, but to their husband or their community or their religion or their legal system. Most of all, the women I have met are familiar with internalizing their resentments and their anger until it scars their souls and leaves them mentally exhausted. So I want to tell you a story, and this happened about 12 years ago when there was a boom in tech startups in West Africa, East Africa. And of course, um, the startups were mostly started by men, very few women. One of those women was a Kenyan who lived in Nairobi. And so from time to time, young people who wanted to do these tech startups would um, pitch to venture capitalists. And so at one of those pitch meetings, which I think happened in Cape Town, this Kenyan woman was the only woman who um, was presenting. So she presented her idea and she asked for money and then afterwards the feedback that she got was that she was not relatable and that she was not likable. And the men got the money, she didn't. 
So she didn't see much of a difference in the overall structure of her presentation and that of the men. And so she decided to name what she thought the problem was. And so the next time she made a pitch to venture capitalists, she said very quietly, I'm a woman, and in our culture, we think women shouldn't be too ambitious, or women who ask for money are judged more harshly. And so I am asking you to please keep this in mind as you listen to me. And she says that this worked, or must have worked, because she didn't get the money, but the next time that she did this, she did get the money. But what was even more telling was that the feedback she got changed, and so now was more specific and more technical. I think that naming things with nuance, with respect, but with boldness, can make a difference. Because we must, fi we must first give something a name in order to change it. I also think that how we name things is important. It is important to name without contempt, to name with the assumption of good faith. She didn't think that the venture capitalists were necessarily bad people. And quite frankly, if there had been a woman among the venture capitalists, that woman would probably have done the same thing. Sometimes we are blinded by norms. And for most of human history, cultural norms have generally not accorded women the same dignity that it accords men. So another pontificating bit for emerging leaders, data is very important, but please look very carefully at the nuances of data collection, especially when it concerns women. Data on domestic violence, for example, I mean, I'm always really interested in, in questions of violence against women and girls. And there was a, in Lagos, a woman who was doing a survey asking women about their experience of violence. And I wanted to look at the forms that she was using. And you know, one of the questions included the expression intimate partner violence. And I said to her, I don't even think the people you're asking know what this even means. You know, that the language that we use matters. If instead you said, um, you know, do your husband's people say anything to you when he beats you? That way you're, you're likely to, you know, get better information. So I think the question is to start to find ways to remove the shame that hangs like a shadow over the subject of male violence against women, especially among women who we traditionally do not expect to tolerate abuse. I think economics as an explanation is true, but it is not the complete story. Culture plays a role. There is the shame of a failed marriage, which is something often women bear much more than men, and also the effects of female socialization, which teaches women that their ability to love is a measure of their ability to sacrifice themselves, sacrifice their own needs, and always put other people first. Do not think of the word quota as a bad word. Men have had quotas for thousands of years, and we called those quotas culture. I have never understood the argument that you should right a deep historical wrong in a way that is completely lacking in any contradiction. Throughout human history, men in all cultures all over the world excluded women from real positions of power. Now, in trying to undo this injustice, quotas for women are perfectly reasonable. But while I support quotas, I do think we should think about the nuances of quotas. There's nothing worse than feeling that you're a token in a workplace, or that you're not qualified, or that your colleagues think you were hired just because you're a woman. For centuries, men who were just good enough, not great or exceptional, just good enough, were hired in positions of power. In fact, many of them are leading countries today. <laughs> so I'm not even really good enough. <laughs> and, so, and so when we talk about quotas, perhaps the language should be about women who are just good enough. Think of culture as a tool of leadership. And here's a small story. 
So a number of years ago, um, the Nigerian government passed a law that criminalized homosexuality and also criminalized talking about it um, and supporting it, whatever that means. And so I wrote a story, and I had a friend, well, an acquaintance, who supported this law, who went on and on about how it wasn't African culture. Um, and so I'd written a story about uh, a gay character. And this friend of mine, sorry, not friend, acquaintance. <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's really not a friend. Read my story. <laughs> And in this story, the character was gay, but the character's sexual orientation was really not the main thrust of the story. And after this person read the story, he said to me, rather sadly, he said, by the time I realized the character was gay, I already liked him. <laughs> it's one of the most hopeful things that anyone has ever told me about my work. It reaffirmed my faith in the power of stories. You know, because of a story, this acquaintance saw the humanity of a person whose human rights he had earlier been in support of squashing. I think that storytelling can change perception. Songs, films, but most of all, the very best kind, books of imaginative writing. Keep in mind always about how women are perceived the same traits that are praised in men are considered often repulsive in women. And these are traits that often help men succeed. So for the same behavior, a man is described as strong or determined, while a woman is called pushy or confrontational or aggressive, often resulting in negative consequences for her. Another anecdote was I, I was speaking to somebody who used to work for um, a woman who was powerful in Nigeria. Um, the woman was powerful in the corporate world. And so this person then says to me, you know, she used to appear um, you know, very nice in public, but you know, back she, then she would get very angry with us when we did something wrong and she would shout. And, and I was supposed to then say that this woman was evil, but what I said to this person was, actually you've just proved that she's a full human being, wonderfully capable of a full range of human emotions. And so I think it's really important in thinking about the judgments that women receive, that we think of how often it is not so much about the behavior itself, but that the behavior is by a woman. Women, and this in particular I think is magnified when a woman is not white, are often not accorded an essential aspect, I think, which is the presumption of competence. Women have to make an effort to prove themselves, and in doing so, they are often then seen as not inspirational or not likable. Women who establish a reputation for competence often take extra precautions to avoid mistakes, and they're more likely to adopt a kind of defensive, maybe even rigid posture, and rely less on their imagination or their creativity. And this, of course, undermines their charisma. Um, you know, they're terrified of coming across as insubstantial because they know that they're already starting off being assumed to be insubstantial. And I remember reading um, about the exit polling um, when Hillary Clinton ran for president. And she was, on the one hand, said to be by the people, 90% of the people who were polled said that she was the most um, competent because she was renowned for her hard work and her attention to policy details, but they also said that she was the least inspirational and the least likable. And apparently a large number of them said they wanted a leader who was likable. Do not expect women to be better. The danger of this kind of thinking that somehow women, just by being women, are better than men or will make better leaders is that if women are seen as somehow better, somehow special, somehow closer to being angels, somehow morally better, then there is a level of autonomy that women can never really have because we cannot be fully free until we're also free to fail. And so while I don't think that women will automatically make better leaders, um, Anecdotally, 
it seems that they kind of are. <laughs> we can look at the countries that were governed by women during um, the COVID pandemic. I mean, there was a difference in the, in the countries that were governed by women and, you know, it, maybe it was the women, maybe it was something in the water that they drank, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I do think, though, that it's not that there's an inherent sort of um, moral goodness in women that men lack. I think it's that probably women are socialized in, in a different way. And I think the way that women are socialized just naturally makes for better leadership. You know, the idea, for example, that women are more likely to believe in the idea of a consensus, um, are less likely to reach for violence as first option, um, and have less of an ego or know when to put their ego aside. Um, you know, I, for example, have a very healthy ego, but I do know when to put it aside to achieve what I consider to be a greater good. And the question I often find myself asking is, you know, does a person like Vladimir Putin know when to put his ego aside? Keep in mind that there's a greater possibility of um, women in positions of power experiencing a kind of casual disrespect from both women and men. I remember once uh, talking about, like I said, something I feel very strongly about, um, male violence against women and girls. And it was in London with a number of women who were all active in, in, in work that was um, about women. And so this woman then, I, when I was done talking about violence against women, she she said to me, you're so passionate about this. Um, and I thought she was saying this with approval until she said the next thing, which is, you're scary. And I just thought, scary, really? Because I'm passionate about a subject. And I started, to, I, I thought about it for quite a bit. You know, why am I scary? Would a man speaking passionately about, for example, how important it is for men to get their prostate cancer screenings be considered scary, always bring nuance to how you mentor girls and young women. It's important to know that young girls today are not okay. Um, there's, there's so many of us that need, um, actually I think if I had a choice, I would give everyone free therapy, particularly Nigerian men. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's some representatives of that, <laughs> of that esteemed <laughs> cult. <laughs> there is an epidemic of girls struggling and sinking, depression, anxiety. I mean, I feel that every day I'm reading a new study that shows how girls are just not doing well, most of it linked to social media use. And so sometimes it feels to me that the feminist slogans that we use can make things seem worse, or maybe maybe make, make them feel burdened. You know, like we can, you can do anything, reach for the sky, girls rule. I just feel that as we use these empowering slogans, we should also temper them with complexity and with nuance. When we tell girls, you know, reach for the sky, we also maybe should tell them that sometimes the wall cuts you down when you do reach for the sky. And maybe also tell them that reaching for the sky can mean different things for different people. Remember that justice is always a multifaceted enterprise. It was the courage and sacrifice of black Americans that ended overt state discrimination, but white Americans helped. It is the courage and sacrifice of women that has brought about the relative progress we have, but men need to come on board. So there's this study that I love to talk about that um, from bookshops about re who reads what. And so, and this was in the UK, but I think it's also true in the US, that um, women read books by men and women, and men read books by men. I don't know if there's any man here who wants to dis dispute that <laughs> with statistics. Who, which other woman have you read, though? <laughs> so, <laughs> 
actually, you know, I've often heard from men who have said to me, you're the only woman I read, and they expect me to be happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I then want to sort of whip out a list of all the women they should read. I mean, the point is, we know that men read men, which often means also that men, men take men more seriously. Men listen to men. In general, of course, we're generalizing, but we should. And so I think we should expect men, invite men to join in this journey of justice. You know, when women start NGOs to help women and girls who have been raped by men, men should also start NGOs to teach boys and men not to rape. I, I once praised a, a Nigerian comedian, a man, and I told him that a lot of Nigerian comedy is lazily misogynistic, where the punchline is always some sort of lazy mockery of women. And so I told him it was very refreshing to listen to him because his comedy wasn't about that. And his reply to me was, I hope you never see any of my earlier skits <laughs> because I said some really stupid things about women. And I found that very moving. And I said to him, you know, I, we're not looking for perfection, we're looking for progress. You know, nobody's perfect. One of the most magnificent gifts I think we have as humans is the ability to remake ourselves, to unlearn the malignant things we have learned, to improve, to take one small step after another towards the journey of progress. And so because we know that gen men generally listen to men, and we want to create a world where men listen to men and women, um, and while we do that, and until we get there, can we ask the good men to please speak up, to take a stand, to act? Um, a few years ago, the, um, there was a bill that failed in the Nigerian Senate, and it was a bill that was for about quotas for women. I think it was sort of a 35% female representation, and it failed. And I was struck by a quote in, in the Nigerian Guardian about it, which said, the male legislators could not be convinced of the relevance. And, <laughs> and so I found myself thinking, well, I suppose we need to find men who can be convinced of the relevance of female participation. So no, we know that there is no country in the world today that has achieved equality for men and women. But equality is also a word whose meaning we have to parse. What do we mean by equality? I have learned from experience that treating people who are not equal as though they are equal is not the way to achieve equality. We must first make them equal, which is to say that the answer to equality is not to treat men and women exactly the same way, because obviously men and women are not the same, and it is in fact the differences between men and women that are the basis of sexism. When I look at the world today, Sometimes I don't want to read the news because there's so much that's unbearable. I find myself thinking of this expression that I love, and it is in one of the most beautiful languages in the world, Igbo. And the expression is, Ifa maropolo. And the literal translation is, things are not standing well. And I, I kind of love the skewed elegance of of this literal translation. But it, in general, it means that things are not as they should be. So I think in the world today, if I'm a Ropolo, and if we want things to start to stand a bit better, we need to include women in real leadership, real power. Um, I want to end by saying, um, a relative of mine told me that um, some people in Nigeria who are not the most pleasant people said, Chimamanda is always talking about women. She wants to be a man. <laughs> and, so, and so I want to end by saying that I am very happy being a woman. <laughs> and if we... Um, Ibo, Ibo, Ibo traditional religion believes in reincarnation. Um, if, we, if we do reincarnate, it would be nice to have, to have a choice to be asked what you want to come back as. And so if that were to happen, I would choose to come back as a black woman. Yeah. With, <laughs> with, 
you know, and you know, I would still have the same chocolate colored skin. I would still have the same kinky hair, both of which I love. But maybe the only thing is I would make myself a bit taller. Just, <laughs> just a bit. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm a king, yes I'm a king, I think I'm a king, king.